Hello everyone. So today we are going to discuss optimality theory. This is part of the course advanced phonology. We have this theory as a theoretical framework included in the syllabus for advanced phonology that is coded with the title LG504. This is a course taught in autumn semester 2021 in your course. So welcome to my class and let's begin. So in this slide we are going to discuss the background, how this theory has began, how OT, so this is the short form, this is the short form for optimality theory and we will talk about how this theory has began. Okay. So around 1990, the two professors, Alan Prince and Paul Smolensky, remember these two names. These are very important for you to remember, Alan Prince and Paul Smolensky. Alan Prince is a professor in Rutgers University in New Jersey and Paul Smolensky is a professor of cognitive science in John Hopkins University in Maryland. Both these universities are located in the United States and they have began to collaborate. When, what, what happened when they collaborated? They began a new theory of human language. And this theory is quite interesting. We will learn how it is interesting. This collaboration led in fairly short order to a book length manuscript. This word manuscript is very, very important to know the background or the historical background of the theory called optimality theory. This is very, very relevant. Relevant again, I say the word manuscript. We will discuss why it is so very important. So they have named the result of their collaboration as optimality theory colon, constraint interaction in generative grammar. So you should remember this title. What's the title? It's optimality theory, constraint interaction in generative grammar. This is again very, very important. So they, they have titled their manuscript as optimality theory. So that is the name that they have devised for the theory that they have developed. Okay. Then we come to the next component of the subtitle. So after the colon, you have the sub subtitle of the manuscript. The second half of the subtitle is generative grammar. So what is generative grammar? You are probably familiar with this term already because in syntax, and any other discipline of linguistics, we talk about generative grammar mainly. Okay. So what generative grammar assumes is that there is an underlying form for every linguistic structure. And that underlying form is called, also called input. Okay. So in that framework of generative grammar, we talk about the underlying form of every linguistic structure and that behaves as the input and then generative grammar has certain components which are capable of generating the output that is also called the surface forms. Now to understand what are what's the relation between the underlying form and the surface form these two are shorthand or acronymed as UR capital block letter UR and SR okay so what happens the native speakers of a particular language thinks or they know certain forms and they think that they know certain forms and that is the underlying form but when we linguists go to the field and collect the data of that language, we don't see the underlying form. What we get is the surface form because native speaker knows something and they perform something or they speak something else. So they know something 
that is the underlying form that is there that is there in their brains in their mental lexicon those words those structure those linguistic aspects are there in their brain okay but what they say actually is the surface form okay uh, so we are not going to deal more much detail about that generative component of grammar but generally to say there are two components you are that is also regarded as the input and then we have the sr that is generally regarded as the output okay so within the optimality theory those two components are taken into account very very importantly okay and what happens constraints interaction happens in generative grammar so these two are very heavy words cons both constraint and interaction but for the time being just note it that constraints are there in every language they are language universally present and they interact in language in language specific ways so remember i repeat it again constraints are present language universally irrespective of languages every constraints are there but they interact in a language specific way okay so that is the crux of optimality theory Okay, so this title of the manuscript of Prince and Smolensky has been, you know, very, very um, uh, meticulously planned title. It's not a very random. It has the entire philosophy of optimality theory is encoded in the title itself. So this is very important to remember. Okay, so we go ahead. Now we will talk about the title manuscript, uh, sorry, uh, the word manuscript, why it is relevant to the, uh, to, to this particular work of Princess Smolensky. So photocopies of the manuscript were widely distributed and had a terrific impact in the field of linguistics. Even though it was not formally published until more than a decade later. As I said, the word manuscript is very important. See, look at this statement. This particular manuscript was as li like a handout we circulate, right? Uh, I have also given you handouts and many other professors must have given you or you, have, you must have received many class notes or, um, you know, some kind of materials that you are graduate. Uh, uh, professors or postgraduate professors have given you okay so those are handouts or some materials that your professors have developed on their own similarly these two professors have also developed this theory and circulated among their students or research groups as a you know in a very casual way as a manuscript initially and that was the year 1993 it was circulated as a manuscript. What is called manuscript? We do not publish. We, that, that particular uh, you know, content pages has not been published by an authority or a publisher or anybody. That means it has not come into a book form or a journal form or any, you know, uh, it has some kind of reputation. But it was uh, circulated. Okay. And then it got extremely widely accepted so so widely accepted that uh, people have read it they apply they employed the uh, crux of those uh, those theoretical assumption of, of ot and then they have uh, incorporated those things into their own analysis of languages walls la many languages have many linguists have come cognitive scientists have come syntacticians uh, you know, all, all from all domains, people have come and read the manuscript, and they, they, they have generated a group that uh, this, this is a group who, who, is, who are dealing with the optimality theory. So widely uh, accepted manuscript, and until 2004, it has remained as a manuscript only. Only in 2004, Rutgers University Optimality Archive, they came forward and published it as a book. So when you have a kind of a referencing 
note for this. Uh, what we do is we we have two variations of this particular work. Of course, from 1993 to 2004, 11 years later. So there are some editions. Uh, the initial edition was a manuscript which got circulated and studied by many for 11 long years until it was formally published. So many have studied only the manuscript and some have studied the book also. So when we refer to this particular work, we need to have a look or uh, take into consideration whether we are referring to the manuscript or we are referring to the book. So these, these two are the important things that you need to know, whether you are talking about the manuscript that is 1993 or you are talking about the book that is 2004. By now you already know what is uh, how to uh, deal with the referencing style. You have the two bibliographic style with you and you also have uh, taken the task two. You have completed task two so you by now you know how to deal with the referencing style. Okay now we move ahead. OT had and continues to have its greatest effect on phonology but it has also led to important work in syntax, semantics, sociolinguistics, historical linguistics, and other areas of linguistics. So, not only phonology, but it has its impact in every discipline within the linguistic framework. This is again very important to know. And OT belongs on anyone's list of the top three developments in the history of generative grammar. So you know how they have taken the crux, they have taken the rationale behind the, um, the, the thing called generative grammar and developed in a, from a new perspective. They have given it a new name or a perspective and developed it as a completely new theory. But definitely the philosophy behind OT is still in the uh, making of generative grammar. So uh, I hope you have understood this particular part. So we are going to deal with the next half of the history of OT. One of Prince and Smolensky's goals for OT was to solve a long-standing problem in phonology. Phonological theory in the tradition of Smolensky and Halle's 1968 Menu, monumental work called the sound patterns of English that is acronymed as SPE was based on rewrite rules. You already know what are phonological rules and those phonological rules are um, you know formulated in this way. A changes to B in between C and D. That means there is a input or a underlying form that is regarded as A and there is a surface form that is regarded as B, right? This is surf, uh, input form or the underlying form and this is the output. And where does this happen? Within C and D. That means before some sound, that means D and after some sound, that means C. And this is the position where uh, the exact uh, location of the this particular sound, that means before the change, that means before this arrow, you had a, a sequence of C, A, D. After the change, that means the change is represented by this arrow here for a synchronic change. So before the change, it was a C, A, D. Now after the change, it is C, B, D. Okay. So this is the proposition or the formulation of a rewrite phonological rule. And this, this has been devised in Sound Patterns of English by Somsky and Halle in 1968. And for decades, that those rewrite rules have been regarded uh, as the most uh, accepted norm how to deal with the phonological rules or processes that languages have, right? So, uh, but after the, uh, the advent of phonal, uh, optimality theory, those rewrite rules have taken a new turn or new perspective. 
So what it describes an input configuration CAD and an A to B transformation that applies to it. So as I said before, a, um, a kind of a string, a sound string that is that was CAD. Now it has become CBD. Okay. So that term transformation applies to it. Rewrite rules can describe a lot of phenomena but they do a poor job of explaining how phonological systems fit together. And that is why Prince and Smolensky have come up with a new, very, very novel idea to generate the surface form SR from the UR. Okay, that is all for today. Thank you.